Welcome in to another special interview from the Association for Materials Protection and Performance. My name is Ben Dubose, and I'm a staff writer with the AMP Publications team. Today, we're joined by Dr. Meru Zamanzada, best known as Dr. Z. Dr. Z, who we've had on before in this AMP interview series, is currently a technical director and principal investigator on projects related to buildings and the utility industry at Mattergenics. He is a NACE fellow and NACE certified corrosion specialist with nearly 30 years of practical experience in corrosion engineering, material selection and design, and cathodic protection and coatings. Dr. Z, good afternoon. How are you? I'm doing fine, and thank you for having me in this important conversation. Yes, absolutely. And we'll get to what that is in just a moment. But before we start, I also want to introduce Clinton Shar, Manager of Transmission Engineering at Southern California Edison, Southern California excuse me, Southern California Edison is the primary electricity supply company for much of Southern California, providing 15 million people with electricity across a service territory of approximately 50,000 square miles. Clinton, thank you for joining us. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. I, and again, uh, echoing what Dr. Z said, thanks for uh, inviting me into this uh, very important discussion. Yes, absolutely. And as some of you listening on our AMP channels may recall, we recently had Dr. Z on to discuss the potential links to corrosion from the tragic collapse of the Champlain Towers in South Florida. That, of course, is the condominium building. Today, we're going to be discussing some of the and exploring some of the potential corrosion concerns related to a different tragedy on the opposite side of the United States, and that's the ongoing wildfires on the West Coast. As of mid-August, the wildfires on the West Coast are extensive, and as it pertains to infrastructure, they can certainly affect the mechanical and corrosion integrity of electric, water, and wastewater assets. More specifically, the extreme temperatures of these wildfires, they can really cause a reduction in the structural strength and even melt the zinc on galvanized steel. This can lead to accelerated corrosion or even the collapse of certain structures at some later time. This corrosion can occur at both above and subgrade portions of structures. However, in most cases, the rate of underground corrosion is much higher than the above grade atmospheric corrosion. The steel structures that are exposed to these wildfires may suffer damage from the heat and smoke, which can affect their mechanical and structural strength, as well as their corrosion resistance. So today we're gonna to be looking at this from a couple of perspectives. We'll start with Clinton, who can speak from the point of view of an electric utility, and then Dr. Z will offer some of his corrosion engineering expertise from his role at Mattergenics. Both of them will also have some slides to help them illustrate their points. Clinton, if we could, let's start with you and really let's start with the basics. What's causing these wildfires and why are they of increasing concern to asset owners and operators on the West Coast? Uh, thanks, Ben. Um, just to kind of give you some brief uh, background, um, we're at Southern California Edison, we've been involved in uh, research in wildfires for the last four or five years. And what I'd like to do is uh, to start this presentation is to kind of give you some background, a very high level background, as far as some of the things that we've learned and some of the work that we're doing. So let's start with the discussion as what is a wildfire? Um, that, very basic, Merriam-Webster Merriam Dictionary defines a wildfire as a sweeping and destructive conflagration especially in a wilderness or rural area. Um, due to global climate change, the world's weather patterns are changing. The ch and the change in the weather patterns is causing large areas of the Western United States to experience an increase in hot, dry drought conditions. As a, as a result of this, this is prime uh, area for an increased frequency and intensity of wildfires. Um, and we're starting to see that in the Western United States. Um, could you move to the next slide, Dr. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the characteristics of a wildfire. We'll talk about conditions that uh, are ideal for wildfires and some of the wildfire characteristics. And again, this is very high level from some of the work that we've been doing. So for the conditions that are, that are conducive to wildfires, typically, it, as we see in the Western United States, we have a very wet season. Typically, wet season is in the, the uh, winter months and the spring uh, months of the year. And what happens is that uh, after we have a very wet season, we have a very dry season. This typically we see this during the summer and fall months. And during the dry season, we have high temperatures, very low humidity, 
And this causes the vegetation that has grown um, during the wet season to, to really dry out and become very bone dry and tender. Um, and what happens is that, uh, as you see here in, in the, the slide, uh, humidity you know, below 23%, dropping to about 10% or less, and very dry fuel, which is 5% you know, moisture uh, content uh, in a thousand hour moisture, in a thousand hour moisture level. So that combined with the hot, dry, sustained um, gusting winds is really uh, the ideal conditions for wildfires. And these wildfires could be started by either nature in terms of like lightning strikes, dry lightning strikes, or by uh, man, you know, in terms of, uh, um, you know, wildfire initiation due to uh, down power lines or, or things of that sort. We found that um, for wildfires, the flame heights can reach approximately two to three times the height of the material being burned with temperatures on the order of about 800 degrees C or 1472 degrees Fahrenheit or more. However, in extreme conditions, we've seen temperatures as high as 1200 degrees C, which is about 2200 degrees F. And uh, contrary to you know, popular belief, the flame front of wildfires actually moves through very quickly. Um, between about four to four, I'm sorry, between six to 14 miles per hour. So if you have a structure that's in a wildfire zone, these structures are actually exposed to a flame front for between 60 to 120 seconds. So it's, it's not that long of a period. So I have a video, uh, which I'd like to show next, which kind of illustrates uh, how a wildfire goes through, or flame front, I should say, goes through a forested area. So um, if we could run the video. So I got this video from uh, a, a consultant who um, is actually testing those um, protection schemes uh, uh, in there. And you can tell that uh, as you see the fires approach, um, the area is, is still rather unscathed. Um, and you can, you can tell as the flame front approaches here that in a matter of seconds, this area will be inundated with um, the high heat. But if you look here, um, the flame, it actually started, the flame front actually hit at about four minutes, 33, um, I'm sorry, the, um, it's about 4.33.20 is when the flame front actually came through. And as you see here, the flame front is still going through, but by the end of this video, which is about a minute long, most of the flame front has actually passed by. So you can see that it's still intense at this point. Um, okay. Okay, looks like uh, we, okay, so I guess we didn't go to the end of the video, but it typically, you know, if you, if we saw the end of the video within about a minute, that flame front would have gone through. So in related to California now, um, 2020 was a record setting year for us. Uh, in that year, we had almost 10,000 wildfires that burned about 4.4 million acres. Uh, we destroyed approximately 10,000 structures and cost almost $12 billion in damages. Uh, if you look at 2019, there were about 4.7 million acres burned. Um, 2018, we had 8.8 .8 million acres burned and about uh, 10 million acres in 2017. So within the last four years, we've had uh, over, um, over between four to 10 million acres burned per year. So with the next graphic, uh, the next slide, uh, we see the instances of wildfires and severity of wildfires throughout the US for about 30 year period from uh, 1983 to about 2014. And by looking at that, uh, the chart below, you can tell two things. Number one is that um, in, in the, between 1983 and the year 2000, we've had instances where we had years of low fire events and high fire events. And you can tell that from, 20, from 1983 to the 2000, um, we've had about maybe about two or three year span intervals between where we have high fire events. However, if you look at um, from, 20, from the year 2000 on to 2014, you can see every year is basically a high fire event. And you notice that the high fire events, um, the amount of damage due to the high fire events are increasing exponentially each year. So if you look at 2014, um, the latest data that we have for 2020 for the US is that approximately over 10 million acres were burned. So you can tell that if you expand this 
graph out to 2020, uh, it is again following that exponential increase in um, fire severity. So what's the response from an electric utility such as Southern California Edison? Okay, that's a good question, Ben. So I'd like to kind of talk about two things. Um, number one is that uh, we are trying to, as, as, you, as I spoke earlier, there are, are several instances where which could cause wildfires. This could be man-made uh, intervention plus na nature. And of course we can't control nature, but we can control the man-made uh, initiation. So what we're doing as a utility is number one, we're trying to reduce the potential for wildfire initiation. In other words, we're trying to um, do vegetation management around our power lines to make sure that uh, we minimize the contact between vegetation and our power lines, which could spark, which could cause sparks to initiate a wildfire. We're also in installing covered conductors. Covered conductors uh, are, you know, have a, it's like a bare wire conductor that has a coating on it or a polyethylene coating on it such that in case, a veg in case vegetation contacts the line, it wouldn't cause a spark which would initiate a wildfire. And the other thing that we're doing in the most extreme case when we, have high, when we know that there's gonna be high winds coming through an area, we actually shut the power off uh, in the areas which are known to be high wind. Um, um, this, cause, this, this will reduce the likelihood that, we would, that a utility would initiate a wildfire. The other thing that we're doing is we're actually hardening our grid. We're kind of hardening our structures to make them more fire resistant. We're installing more fire resistant structural materials. We're using steel poles and towers. We're using concrete structures and we're using uh, reinforced, polym reinforced polymer structures or composite structures, which are protected, uh, which will kind of give us more protection than a, a typical wood pole when exposed to fire. Uh, for, existing for existing structures, we are installing uh, coatings and shields to protect the existing structures from, um, from wildfires. So we're taking a two-pronged approach. We're, we're reducing the potential for wildfire initiation and we're trying to harden our system to protect them against wildfires in case it does start. Uh, one of the things that um, was a concern to us um, is that you know, steel structures, they go through wildfires. While we know steel does not burn, uh, we found out by discussions with Dr. Z that um, the, when, when exposed to high heat, it could change the material properties of steel. Um, it could, the high heat could adversely the material properties such that it could make them uh, brittle. It could lower the uh, tensile strength of the steel. Uh, it, it, could it could reduce the material strength such that the design uh, factor of safety of the structure may be below the required minimums that are needed by code. So for that, we decided to work with uh, Matogenics and Dr. Z to help us analyze some of our structures that have gone through uh, high fires to determine whether we have any changes in the steel characteristics and reduction in material uh, strengths of the material. So, so yes. So thanks, Ben. That was a good question. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for giving us some insight from your unique perspective. And now that we've heard from Clinton, as far as Southern California Edison and the role of an electric utility, now we're gonna hand things off to Dr. Z, who's gonna discuss some of the technical considerations and the factors at play. Dr. Z, take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Clinton, for that uh, very good introduction to this important subject. I start with AISC. American Institute of Steel Construction. They recommend basically three different categories. Category one, straight members that appear to be unaffected by fire. Generally speaking, they go then to category two, members that are noticeable deformed, but that could be straightened. Category three are those that they are deformed and they should be considered for replacement. A very important note is that the above classification does not consider galvanized steel, weathering steel phase transformation that are not visually observable. In other words, there are changes in materials when they are exposed to high temperatures that you cannot see sometimes. However, on-site non-destructive measurements can determine and confirm if these members exhibit 
softening, embrittlement, hardening, or loss of ductility. In short, there are changes that you cannot see by eyes or visual examination. And that's going to be a, an important topic to, to be discussed in next slides. What I have for you here is the effect of wildfire on a structural impact. I have defined three ranges of temperatures that I thought is very important to consider about the structures after the exposure to wildfire. Greater than 200 degrees C. This results in decrease in modulus of elasticity. Between 200 to 400 changes are taking place, but if the temperature goes exceeds 400 degrees C, you will see a decrease in yield strength. And also zinc will begin to melt. At above 600 degrees C, there is a major risk, unacceptable risk. 50% loss in the strength and oxidation will occur. This is irreversible, basically. I have put some examples of what's going on during and after exposure to wildfire on the pictures that you can see on the left side. There is this tower that was exposed to wildfire and you can clearly see there is evidence of bending deformation and sometimes even movement of these members. The pictures in the middle gives you two different mm -hmm. microstructure of steel. The one that is normal prior to wildfire, which is called paralytic structure A, and B, it shows a structure that is exposed to wildfire at higher temperatures of exceeding 600 degrees. You clearly see there is a difference between these two. And also please note that upon exposure to higher temperatures above 780, 800 degrees Fahrenheit, you will actually melt zinc. And this is exhibited in the photograph on the right hand side. You can clearly see zinc is melted. And this says to us, to all of us that the corrosion protection is no longer there because there is no zinc on the structure. So let's summarize what we said here. At Above 400 degrees C, you will affect the modulus of elasticity. At 600 degrees, you will lose 50% of the strength. Of course, this all depends on the time of exposure. If the time is extremely short, the mechanical properties return to their initial values after cooling down. However, if the time is long, they are irreversible and they won't ever come back to their original properties. A very important issue is if it still is exposed to high temperatures and then is rapidly cooled. And we all know that fire extinguishing liquids are used to, uh, uh, for these structures to turn off the fire. This may result in embrittlement and loss of ductility will result. So for any asset owner or operator that's out there listening, what should they consider if they're gonna be looking into a condition assessment for these types of factors? Excellent question. After exposure to high temperatures of wildfire, the project owner should consider site documentation at high elevation, mid elevation, and ground by a metallurgist and a drone pilot. 
three fairly uh, certified drone pilot that has experience in this subject. Thermal imaging also is an important condition assessment that can be used after exposure to wildfires. A very important issue is focus measurements, dimensional measurements that should be performed in order to see if there is any evidence or lack of deformation. Non-destructive testing techniques like on-site hardness measurement and on-site metallurgical inspection will provide very interesting data regarding embrittlement, softening, or loss of uh, corrosion protection on the material. Let's look at some examples. This photograph is showing a tower leg and the, the, the arrows point to deformed steel. And basically you can clearly see, see a change in linearity along the tower leg. The next one is the condition assessment after exposure to fire. What you like to do is to do non-destructive testing at different areas of the tower that especially exhibit discoloration. You can clearly see discoloration. It doesn't look like a dull looking galvanized steel. It looks like it's sustaining. It looks like there is dark colors. So those areas are important and should be assessed by non-destructive testing as indirect measurement in the beginning. Well, in this slide, which is a, a more detailed study after uh, the, doing the first indirect assessment, we call it direct assessment. We, the picture A shows that we looked at the structure that exhibits uh, some type of serious uh, problems as far as mechanical properties. And then we took cross section, we polished it, we put it under microscope and let's go through these pictures together. Look at number B, picture identified as B. Literally there is no galvanized uh, layer on this surface anymore. That means this structure does not have any protection after exposure to wildfire. Fire. If you look at the picture identified as C on the left side, you see evidence of extreme formation of oxides on the surface of galvanized steel. Picture identified as D on the right hand side on top, it shows presence of voids, big, large voids in this galvanized layer. And picture identified as E shows delamination of galvanized layer. All of them indicate there is no more corrosion protection on this material due to confined areas that zinc has been affected, oxidized, delaminated, or doesn't exist anymore. So what should we do on condition assessment? The question that you ask. We should perform dimensional check, zinc coating thickness measurements, wall thickness measurements, non-destructive hardness measurements that can give us the information about mechanical properties, corrosion potential measurements, Sometimes we need to do metallurgical on-site investigation. These are all non-destructive. And on the concrete foundation, we need to do compressive strength hammer impact test measurement to see if there is more uh, detailed work, more direct assessment of concrete by petrographic analysis is needed. Give you an example of what's happening after a 
tower that is exposed partially to wildfire. The corrosion potentials of minus 8.8 .8 volts versus copper copper sulfate indicate it's acceptable. However, when you do the measurements and you get minus 0 0.40 versus copper copper sulfate is not acceptable. It means there is no zinc on that surface that can protect this structure. A 4,000 PSI for concrete compressive strength is acceptable. But if you do the measurements after wildfire exposure, you get 1500 or lower, it's not acceptable. Metallurgically, if you do a non-destructive metallurgical evaluation, ferritic, paralytic structures are acceptable. Martensitic structures are not acceptable because it indicates you have loss of ductility you have embrittlement in place that upon impact, you can have cracking and failure. Hardness and the strength also provides a very good performance from mechanical properties point of view. A 90 hardness measurement, Vickers hardness is acceptable versus a 70 hardness, Vickers hardness measurement is not acceptable. So you can see we have quantified the risk and have critical values for acceptance or non-acceptance. Give you an example. This is a tower that was ex partially exposed to wildfire. A site was fully exposed, B site was partially exposed to wildfire. Let's see what's going on in this tower. First, this is an interesting picture, photo. Uh, we saw an initiation of a wildfire. The red arrow is indicating that. Then the question becomes to be the concrete. The aggregate composition is very important on acceptable risk acceptance of the concrete. If there is carbonate, reduction up to 50% at 427 degrees. It means that if you know the temperature, you know that your modulus of elasticity has changed. Silicus has 50% at 427 degrees, which is equivalent to 800, reduction up to 50%. Nat lightweight, natural or manufactured, reduction up to 40% at 427 degrees C. So let's look at some examples. The photograph on the left side shows that this site is exposed to wildfire. You can see by discoloration mm. on the load bearing member and also on the concrete. Uh, on the right hand side of this tower, you can see evidence of very mild exposure to high temperature. Both the concrete and galvanized steel look completely different. Here a technician is measuring the corrosion potential of different surfaces and identifying if the zinc is left on the surface or is gone and there should be some protection after wildfire exposure. This area shows a non-effective leg of this tower. And then you can use hardness as a performance parameter that can determine the mechanical yield strength based on non-destructive testing. This is a very interesting way of determining without cutting the sections of the tower was cooking there. So give us an example, if you could, what ends up happening with regards to the specific temperatures and the mechanical properties? What happens as we go through a wildfire and you get to these varying degrees? Well, as I mentioned before, there are three regions of temperatures 
that you have to be concerned. Greater than 200 degrees C, greater than 400 degrees C, and greater than 600 degrees C. The critical temperature, obviously 600 degrees C, it means you already are, have lost 50% of strength and oxidation will also take place. At 400 degrees C, you start to have the melting temperature. So this all gives us a very important performance parameter that can indicate which structures we should look at after the exposure to wildfire. There are hundreds of the structures that may be suspect. So the question is how to identify the structures that have been exposed to wildfire and need special attention, condition assessment from mechanical integrity and corrosion point of views. All along I have been talking about temperatures, critical temperatures. So monitor the temperature and corrosion potential and during, after using sensors. That will, that will provide for you specific sites that you need to be concerned and pay attention to. These sensors can identify where are those structures. Then this, they can have up to four temperature sensors at different areas of the tower. It can have up to four corrosion sensors. The signal will be submitted immediately by satellite to the project owner. And they can last three to five years. And the operating temperatures could go high as high as 1600 degrees Fahrenheit. On the left, you can see a sample, a photograph showing one of these sensors. So let's see what type of data we get. The left-hand side is shows the graph of temperature versus time. And you all saw in the video that Clinton showed, this process takes place very rapidly. So you are monitoring the temperature versus time. And we already defined three ranges of critical temperatures. 200, 400, and 600. So by knowing this graph immediately during and after wildfire exposure, you will know what structures should be paid attention and condition assessment should be taken immediately afterwards. Those that they go above 600 degrees C they lose 50% of their strength and extreme oxidation may take place if the time of exposure is long. To summarize, upon exposure to wildfires, materials change properties depending on temperature of exposure. 400 and 600 degrees are temperatures that we should be concerned. These are critical temperatures, especially 600 degrees that you lose 50% of the strength. In most cases, just looking at these structures cannot determine the change and quantify the risk that they are under risk. This is very important that Knowing the temperature, you should do direct assessment. There are sensors available that transmits the wildfire temperature and corrosion potential immediately during and after exposure to wildfires. These sensors could be very important in identifying specific structures that need special attention and condition assessment. Once you identify those structures, you should look at the corrosion fatigue and embracement if they are exposed to 
extinguishing liquids that can cause specific phase transformations that result in embrittlement. In short, we need to pay attention to condition of these structures after exposure to wildfire because they may be at high unacceptable risk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, fantastic insight there. Before we sign off, for any of our listeners at AMP that might want more information, what are some of the resources that they could potentially look for or get online? Well, there are a lot of information regarding uh, methodological characteristics of galvanized steel and weathering steel when exposed to uh, high temperatures. There, are, there is a lot of information about various aspects of wildfire, inc including the physical and methodological and corrosion characteristics. A very important issue is to look into sensors that can detect temperature and corrosion potential during the wildfire and afterwards. And by knowing that we have technologies in place that immediately this data can be sent, we can have high confidence level that these certain structures are affected and some other structures are not affected. Clinton, is there anything that you wanted to add before we sign off? Yeah, I'd like to add that, uh, you know, in, in my initial discussion regarding the um, electric utility response, you know, as you indicated, there are several fronts. We look at minimizing ignition, uh, being an ignition source. We looked at protecting or we looked at um, hardening our system by bringing on new types of uh, uh, structure products, uh, concrete, um, steel. However, Dr. Z brings up a good point in that we need to really look at uh, what happens to our existing structures when they go through a wildfire. You know, and as indicated earlier, you know, we, you know, we traditionally believe that steel doesn't burn, so we didn't really pay much attention to that. However, uh, in discussions with Dr. Z, um, there is things that are happening that could happen within the steel um, material characteristics that we were not aware of, that we should be aware of. And I believe that, you know, Dr. Z uh, is assisting us in doing that analysis and with his environmental sensor, that'll probably be able to give us a more accurate read as far as the temperatures which our towers see. Uh, and then from there, we can kind of make a better assessment as far as whether uh, the temperatures were high enough where we really need to do uh, a more detailed evaluation. But, uh, but thanks again for inviting me to be a part of this uh, discussion. Absolutely. One more point, one more point I have. Uh, I do like to mention that all metallic assets when they are exposed to wild uh, fires, they go through the same process, bridges, pipelines, tanks, all metallic assets go through the same process. So these issues we discussed can be applied in other industries. Too. That's really good insight. I hadn't considered that, but it makes sense, absolutely. Folks, this is where we will wrap things today. I wanna to thank again, our panelists, Dr. Z from Mattergenics and also Clinton Shar from uh, Southern California Edison. In addition to the resources that they tossed out in the last few minutes, I also wanna note that if you're listening to this on YouTube, well, watching it there or listening via our podcast, with YouTube in particular, Dr. Z is very active in the comments section. So if you have a question about this subject and you want more information, I think Dr. Z would be happy to interact with you there and you can uh, get in touch with him in the comments section again, right beneath this video on YouTube. So I think it'll be a pretty easy uh, place for a QA and a if any of you want uh, further information or have additional questions moving forward. Anyway, with that, we will sign off again for Clinton Shar and Dr. Z. My name is Ben DuBose. Thanks again for listening and please come back soon for another interview from AMP.